Welcome to AZ TechCast, sponsored by the Arizona Technology Council, with your hosts, Steve Zylstra and Karen Nowitz. AZ TechCast is dedicated to covering innovation and technology in Arizona and beyond. Broadcasted monthly, AZ TechCast invites leading experts to have real conversations about what is happening in the tech sector across the state of Arizona. From regional news to innovative startups, companies, and emerging technologies, AZ TechCast covers the critical issues and economic trends propelling the state's growing tech ecosystem. Hello and welcome to AZ TechCast and another episode in 2024. We dive into the dynamic world of leadership and in this insightful episode today, we're joined by esteemed guest Victor Assad, CEO of Assad Strategic HR Consulting, Carol Stewart, Vice President with Tech Parks Arizona, and Art Taylor, PayPal's Vice President of Global Compliance Investigations. Today, we're going to unravel the secrets of effective leadership and gain valuable perspectives from these industry leaders, providing a compass for both aspiring and seasoned professionals, navigating the complexities of leadership in the ever-evolving tech landscape and beyond. I'm Karen Nowicki, and because we have such a full house and I am producing at the same time I'm co-hosting, you won't see me on screen. You'll just have to listen for my radio voice. <laughs> and I'm very happy to be here today with uh, Steve Zoster as well, who's our co-host and president of Arizona Tech Council. And we are going to have this conversation today with um, a dynamic team. And Steve, I'd love for us, if you could, to start off with a brief introduction about you as the CEO of the council, and uh, and then we'll go on and have everybody else introduce themselves as well. Sounds great. Um, Steve Zylstra, I'm president and CEO of both the Arizona Technology Council and our foundation, the SciTech Institute. And... Um, a little uh, brief on the Tech Council. We're a statewide trade association, member-based. Um, we have offices in Phoenix uh, and Tucson. We do public policy advocacy at the state and federal level. We do over 100 events uh, a year. Uh, we have lots of publications, reports, magazines, newsletters, and we negotiate lower cost products and services on behalf, <clears throat> excuse me, on behalf of our members. We have uh, an association health plan, uh, giving reduced costs to our, particularly our smaller members, and we run a, a 401k program. So even if you had three or seven or 12 employees, uh, you could attract the best talent by offering them a 401k uh, retirement plan. So full service, uh, traditional trade association, but focused exclusively on science and technology-based enterprises. And with a wide, wide reach, well beyond Arizona border, we've had the fortunate opportunity. I think today's our 46th episode, I think we just discovered. Uh, we've had the opportunity to have delegates from other countries, a lot of folks within the United States making a, a big difference in the world of technology, everything from big enterprise to you know the smaller providers. So thank you for that. And uh, looking forward to another conversation. So let's go ahead and have each of you introduce yourselves, your role, and the organization you represent. And would you mind starting for us, Victor, please? I would be happy to. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm uh, the head of a company. I was told the name after myself, and I wouldn't have any legal trouble. So it's Victor Assad, Strategic HR Consulting. We help companies upgrade their HR function. We help them improve management, leadership, compensation plans. We do investigations. And we also help companies develop leaders and their cultures to be more innovative. Because when companies have more innovative, open, transparent cultures, they are much more profitable. They do very well on diversity measures. They're more innovative, more productive. It does wonderful things for them. So I love this. I love getting up and doing this work all the time. Uh, we're happy to be working with clients here in Arizona in the tech industry, other industries, and also across the country. Thank you. Carol, how about you next? Great. Uh, well, first of all, I have to say I'm very proud to be a board member of the Arizona Tech Council. Um, so Carol Stewart, I'm a vice president at the University of Arizona, um, which means, what does that translate to, um, uh, is I lead the Tech Parks Arizona initiative for the university. We are a separate 501c3, um, and we are charged with, uh, I'm leading, I'm CEO of two tech parks, the UA Tech Park at Rita Road, uh, which is celebrating its 30th anniversary year. 
And I'm also CEO of the UA Tech Park at the Bridges, our second tech park. Um, that also means I'm president of the UA Center for, for Innovation. That is our startup incubator network for science and tech uh, startups. Uh, we contribute um, traditional, you know, the park that's 30 years old, we are 2 million square feet. Um, we have over 100 companies that call this home. We are one of the largest employment hubs in Southern Arizona and Tucson, and we employ 6,000 knowledge workers. Uh, we can also contribute $2 billion annually to the economy of Arizona. So as a crazy Canadian that came down here five years ago, I'm pretty proud of what we're doing here. Um, and on the startup side, we have for the last two years, we've had between 60 and 80 startups in our program, uh, which is the lar highest concentration of startups anywhere in the state of Arizona. Hmm. How did you find your way to Arizona? I got a phone call that said we, we need to. Yeah, we want we want you to apply. Um, I was ready to to uh, uh, you know tap into my network of people that were looking for new opportunities, and they said, "Time out. We want you to come down and and talk to us about this opportunity." And I just couldn't resist. And uh, by the way, she was in Waterloo, which is really a tech haven in in Canada. So Blackberry, a lot of technology right? I think started there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that's great. Yeah, well, glad to have you. Uh, and I just shared with uh, Steve a bit ago that Lisa Rahurik is a new board member on AZ Tech Council and a very dear friend of mine. So uh, you all will get to know each other quite well, I'm sure. Art, we'd love to have your introduction as well. Awesome. Um, Art Taylor, again, really happy to be here. Um, hopefully I can steal some uh, consulting from Victor, again, as I mentioned <laughs> to him before. Um, I get the pleasure of leading a, a group of um, investigators and operational professionals for PayPal. And so, again, just uh, I'm sure most people know, but PayPal, almost 30,000 or so employees um, located all over the globe. Uh, with a mission to democratize payments. And so really just thinking about how we can bring the right uh, tech infrastructure, but also technical products uh, to people all over the world to be able to utilize and be a part of e-commerce. Um, you can imagine that also brings a certain level of risk, um, an opportunity for us to make sure that we're able to defend against. So um, the most of what my team is responsible for is just thinking about our financial risk, thinking about um, our anti-money laundering risk, things of that nature. Um, but we also get a, a really great opportunity to think about how technology can be a part of how we're able to do those things and continue to serve our community. So um, in addition to that, I get to do a lot of work with um, all of our teams that are in the Valley um, or in Arizona. We've got a really diverse team, everything from marketing to um, compliance, uh, HR to um, other operational groups. Uh, you know, technology developers, things of that nature. So just getting a chance to be able to help guide the strategy as we think about how we're able to connect in with the Valley has been a great opportunity. Um, and as of last year, um, a board member, late last year, a board member as well of the Tech Council. So um, really happy to be here. Thank you for being and, here. And I should say that if uh, any of the audience wants to make a contribution to our political action committee, they would do so through PayPal. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I love it. Right. And how long have you been in Arizona? I've been in Arizona now for 16 years. Um, so moved here from the Bay Area uh, where I went to, to college and started um, some work for Bank of America. And since then, for the last 20 years, been a part of um, different parts of the financial sector, whether it's retail banking, um, credit card companies, American Express. I was here in the Valley for about 10 years doing that. Um, so, yeah, a little while now. Yeah. I feel like I'm close to a native almost. We, we, I think we can dub you a native. All right, yeah. All right. I didn't ask you. How about you? How long have you been in Arizona? So I've been in Arizona for 16 years. And the first eight years were from 96 to 2004. And I led HR for Medtronic's um, pacemaking, uh, hardware development and manufacturing business. Global business uh, based here in Tempe, right. but global. A lot of fun. And then I went over to Medtronic and headed up... Um, uh, or excuse me, before that, I worked at Honeywell Space Systems when we were developing shuttle and station, uh, deep space uh, programs you hear about now. It was a lot of fun, a lot of Star Trek talk among those engineers, a lot of purpose. Went to California with Medtronic, Santa Rosa, California, and led uh, HR for coronary and peripheral, and then came back here. My wife grew up in a desert, wanted to uh, return to a desert. And so we are back and, uh, you know, catching up. And now it's been eight years with old friends and, and taking the consulting business with me here in, in Arizona. It's been a, been a lot of fun. 
I love it. Well, today's conversation is going to uh, really be a great guide for our listeners and our viewers around leadership and really each of you sharing an incredible perspective. So let's start with a kind of a broad stroke. What do you, each of you, and we'll kind of do this around Robin. I should have said this before we went on live. Instead of waiting for Steve and I to always be the gatekeepers, please just jump in there. Uh, so sometimes there's a little awkward pause while you're, you know, people are deciding who wants to speak first. Uh, the first question I have for us, though, is what do you believe is the biggest challenge that leaders face today? I think the biggest challenge leaders face today, and particularly um, if you look at middle management first, is that they've always been torn between what executives want in mm -hmm. serving the mission of the organization and making a profit, growing the business, and then what's going on with employees. And today we have, in my view, and I write blogs about this, we have too much conflict there about returning people from remote work, about hybrid work, about quiet quitting, quiet firing, quiet whatever. And what we really should be focused on as businesses from the executives to middle managers and the employees is how to drive that business, service the, cust the clients and the higher mission that most companies serve. When you can get your employees focused on that and, get, and your managers, middle management has a big job in interpreting that and, and keeping people focused on that, you'll be more profitable. You'll be more productive. You'll grow better. Stop reading uh, the Wall Street Journal. I contribute there sometimes. If they take you too much down this realm, and other organizations do it, about being divisive with your employees, find what works for your business. And I would tell you hybrid working, remote working can work. I implemented in 2012 with uh, Medtronic. They still do it. But let's focus on the business, your clients, the higher purpose of why your company exists particularly in the tech field, and you're going to be a lot better and you can avoid all this chaos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think mission and purpose are, are two of the toughest things. Um, I'll, I'll give a little bit of an anecdote, um, not to just completely say everything that Victor just said is so great. Um, one of the things that, that I really looked for from a compliance perspective, especially being in a segment or an area, that oftentimes the, the technology, the tools, the things we bring about, they're, they're likely going to outpace at times regulation, right? And so the way that we have to really think about, and this is similar again from a leadership perspective is <clears throat> being focused or being driven off of something other than the guidelines or the external influences, right? Whether that's share price, whether that's um, Wall Street Journal, whether that's regulations. And so what we've really tried to design um, is an ethics-based compliance program, right? And that thinks about, tries to think really a bit ahead of our purpose and our mission and try to be driven that way. What we have found is that it's also extremely motivating to a lot of our employees. There's there's less of what we have to do to try to inspire and get people going in the work that we're doing if there's a connection to the mission and the purpose. And where I find it, again, gets incredibly difficult is trying to find a way for people to constantly connect that given that there's different changes. And I think that's really the role of a leader is to connect every single thing that your person does to that mission and purpose. It shouldn't feel, um, shouldn't feel vague or, or where there's this lack of correlation. I think that's where you start to lose the level of engagement or, or inspiration that people may naturally have when they first arrive, right? We all know that person, that people, when they start working with us, they're really enthusiastic, they're excited about being there. It's how do you maintain that, capture that, and continue to multiply that? I think it's the real purpose and point from a leadership standpoint. Terrific, terrific comment so far. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pile on both of these, um, and and come back to uh, people, place, and program. Um, you know, there's a there's definitely a place portion of what we do at the tech parks, um, and that's that's finding its way. You know, where it's gonna land is where it's gonna land, and it'll be the best solution for each one of the companies that we deal with. But I think I think on the people side, and I'm gonna uh, Victor, you mentioned this in your opening comments. I think culture. Um, is where we struggle right now. And we, we see that in a lot of the companies that, you know, the 100 plus companies that we have here at the tech park. So whether it's a startup company building culture um, or whether it's a, one of our large tenants um, that have thousands of employees, how do, you, how do you maintain that culture through this new paradigm? Um, and so I think that that is, is, is one of the, the, the areas in addition to everything that you gentlemen have mentioned, um, is another area that we sort of need to figure out. How do we how do we create that water cooler, um, those water cooler moments 
um, that that people that are in the office are having, but those that um, are remote and hybrid don't have. So how do we how do we be inclusive and continue to build a really strong culture? So um, what are some of the essential uh, attributes that leaders need to have to uh, lead teams in a very effective way? What are the critical skills and uh, capabilities that are necessary? Because um, most most leaders are managers, but leadership is in management. Yeah, yeah. Look, uh, again, Victor, we're, I'm going to take your lead here on this, but I'll, I'll just say, I'll just say a couple attributes that I find um, that are in the most effective leaders that I've had an opportunity to work with is one. I think that they're absolutely and completely open to the opportunity or their possibility of something else being the right possible approach, right? So that you know. Can you imagine or, or can we constantly imagine that there's another way of doing things? Can you constantly imagine that there's another way we can approach um, certain things, that opportunity? And the aspect of just listening, right? Like we, we've, we um, so Alex Chris is the, the new CEO of, of PayPal um, recently over the last, I think he's been here about 90 days or so. And one of the things that I've really recognized from his leadership is uh, the listening tour that he's been on has been very intensive and been very much focused in on listening. When I've watched other leaders at times come in and really want to provide a voice and a direction and a mission right away. I think at times you really have to sit back and make sure that we're really absorbing as much as we possibly can to understand what we want to go after. Without it, similar to what Carol just mentioned about the places, right? I think there's preconceived notions um, at times around what is the best possible place that a person can do their best work. Some may think, hey, it's not at home because my style is to be here, right? Um, some may think that, you know, those different things. So I think the best leader, though, is open to the possibilities of different avenues, different ways to do it. And the listening component is to, it, it can be understated. You really got to spend your time and, and have a great way to do that. And your leadership team, by the way. So, Yeah, that's a great point. Your point about listening, my compliments to your CEO. We know from oodles of research from my company, uh, from... Google, from MIT's uh, Human Dynamics Lab, that there is one of about 11 factors of managers that makes managers effective. And it's called building trust or psychological safety if you want to be a psychologist. And I just uh, was doing a training session and somebody asked me, how do you build trust as a leader? I may have to lay off 10% of these people. I may have to uh, you know, put somebody on a performance improvement plan. My response is, is yes. Building trust doesn't mean you don't manage the business smartly. At Medtronic and Honeywell, we had layoffs all the time. And that's, that's a big company adjusting, and they all do it. So how you build trust is you follow up on what you say you're going to do. You have transparency. You give feedback, proactively give feedback. Uh, do it in a nice way. And I'm talking about constructive feedback, and it's very effective when you provide coaching or you assign a coach who might be better at coaching than you are. So um, good listening is a big part of that. Certainly leaders have to be very good at setting up goals, reinterpreting what the CEO says to make it relevant to that manager and his or her team. Uh, you know, they have to have metrics in place, the follow-up, the tough conversations, but in a polite, professional way. And if you build trust with people, they're gonna do what you mentioned, that mission, uh, be tied to that mission and support because they care about this company and they want to they want to see it succeed so important yeah completely agree leave me some bits here gentlemen my <laughs> goodness you're covering a lot um i had trust down as well victor um and i love that uh, art that leaders speak last and and i and it's, it's a hard thing for me to do but that's something that i work on every day as well but um so trust was on my list and then the next thing i had on there was courage I think as as leaders, um, you know, we have to have the courage to do what's best um, for the team and the company at all times, um, which does, like you said, require tr trust. But I mean, jumping and 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 the other um, side of that, the other edge of that, I think, is that we need to have the courage to pursue new initiatives and new challenges for the team, for the company. Um, and I'm in that position right now at the University of Arizona. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pushing the university to think outside the box. We are the land grant university and there are some opportunities for us in one of our locations to really, really think outside the box. So I'm pushing a lot of people, I'm pushing my team um, and pushing a lot of people at the university. But I think, I think, 
you know, to, to achieve those great things, we need to have courage and, uh, and, and the trust of our teams to, to actually make those happen. So we've talked uh, a lot, all of you have, about teams. And um, what are the um, essential elements of uh, developing high-performing teams? Uh, and maybe if you have some anecdotes uh, of, of your own, it would be helpful. Why don't we go with Carol, you go first, first, Carol? Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> go that first. way we follow you. <laughs> um, some of the 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 you know what I think is is really important for high performing teams is is obviously shared goals. Um, you know, without shared goals, no nobody knows where they're 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 going. The shared visions, shared goals. Um, but I like to share leadership as well. So I like to empower. Um, my leadership team, it's not all about me, not everything comes through me, but about in, empowering my team um, to move their part of the vision forward. Um, always door open, you know, if they need to, if they need some advice, they need to deal with a difficult situ situation, the door is always open. Um, so communication, communication is really important um, and collaboration. So when we win, everybody feels like they've got, they've, they've had a, a, a piece of that win as well. Um, so th those are some of the, so those are some of the, you know, those aren't really attributes, but those are some of my philosophies that I use with, with my team here, which is world-class. I, I do have to state that, you know, we've got one of the best tech parks in the, in, in North America. Um, my team collectively has, you know, well over 150 years of experience. Um, so this is a very highly skilled team. So it can be intimidating for those newcomers to come into this team, you know, with, with 30 days of experience under their belt. But again, everybody wins. Everybody has a piece of the win. Um, and so I think that's really important moving, you know, to, to move the ship forward on little initiatives and really big ones at the same time. Can I ask a side question of you, Carol? Um, it, it's true with uh, any entity that's government funded that um, typically you can't pay the kind of salaries uh, that the private sector pays. Um, how do you overcome that in your particular environment? Sure, that's a great question, Steve. And a lot of people don't know this, but we're actually a component of the University of Arizona. So we're actually a 501c3. Um, there's probably two dozen people that are on my team. There's only three of us that actually work for the university. Okay. Um, and so I'm one of them. And we, we actually pay the univers university back 100% of our salaries plus an administration fee. So we are completely self-sufficient from the university. And so we can pay market wages. Okay. And uh, so, so um, you know, it's one of those, it, you know, good moments for us um, at this time that, that we are completely self-sufficient uh, from the university. So we can be competitive and uh, which is, which is definitely nice uh, when, when times are, are as challenging as they are right now to attract people and keep people. Gentlemen, um, around high-performing teams. Yeah, I'll I'll maybe just touch on a on a couple of things. And Carol, I love the the points. Um, you know, especially around thinking around making sure that the people have a very focused connection to to what they're doing. Um, I, I feel like that's almost got to be first and foremost. You know, just after understanding why are we here, and you know, some of those things. Um, I, I think the other though that I've recently really started to dive into um, is creating the right kind of stretch targets um, for people and making sure that they are, um, they're challenged, right? I, I think the highest performing teams are those that um, are constantly striving, right? Instead of those that are um, maybe a little bit more dedicated toward a particular goal that's fixed or static. Some of those teams that are constantly challenging themselves seem to be the ones that you know, it's kind of the sports analogy. It's us versus us a little bit versus us versus the, whatever that goal or competition is. Um, and I've, I've dove into a, you know, recently I've kind of fell into the, the rabbit hole of, um, uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Andrew Huberman. Uh, I think he's a neuroscientist and professor at Stanford. And he talks a lot about, um, the science behind stretch targets and how there's a real, um, element of, of reaching your best and most capacity of highest performing teams all the way down to how we incentivize people and how early you bring in those incentives, right? If the incentive is almost too early, you kind of stunt that stretch and that goal of that next piece. So I, I would just encourage leaders to really think about um, your targets. This isn't moving the goalposts constantly, right? This isn't, you know, gaming things from that standpoint, but just really openly and honestly and transparently, uh, Victor, as you said, thinking about the design and how we can get people just to be at their very, their very best, which is, Hey, I believe in you and believe in you to be capable of doing more 
So what, what are we possible or capable of doing? Um, and the last thing I'll just say on that, on that piece around the highest performing teams typically don't have the same type of uh, static or, or, or maybe not static, but they don't have as much confines around roles and responsibilities, right? Like they, they have a little bit more latitude and empowerment to go and help and assist wherever they possibly can versus being confined in this is my job and this is the only piece that I do and I don't really look left or right. I just kind of look forward a little bit. I think the highest performing teams are teams. They're people that work collectively together that, yes, they understand how to do their job and that piece, but they're also able to kind of continue to um, step into other areas and really grow and blossom that way. Yeah, that's a great point that you're making there, and particularly on the stretch goals and people being very committed uh, in working with clients. I often recommend they use OKRs, and you're nodding at that. You know what that is. So these are our objectives, and they're designed to be a stretch. And but the key uh, results and the milestones is is what they work through month by month, quarter by quarter, and they'll find across different dimensions, particularly innovation teams, that they can move faster in some areas and move up the timeline for completion. Though there may be uh, longer uh, areas that take more time to investigate or may they may come to an obstacle the organization can't overcome. But that is really important. And that builds a lot of teamwork, a lot of sharing, looking to the left and the right that you've said. So that's a great point. If I could circle back to something you've mentioned, uh, when organizations can't pay competitively with money, think about what other equity you can offer your employees. One of the biggest ones now is flexibility. And so whether that's hybrid work or flexible times that you start work to avoid rush hour or fit it in with family schedules, remote work, that is uh, keenly important across all genders, all ages, and despite what we may think, that's what the research tells me, but it's particularly important with women who still have most of the childcare responsibilities and that is very enabling with them. From my days in Silicon Valley, we know uh, equity with stock is a big thing, and there's sometimes a little bit of underpayment there. But there's other equities, and one of them is mission equity. And so back to what you were saying and what you were saying, Carol, that when an organization really, when the employees really believe on the mission of the organization and giving back, they'll join an organization even though it's not competitive pay. I'm smiling a little bit on the conversation around stretch goals because I I think my team would say that they're always operating under stretch goals. <laughs> no doubt. Um, so can I, can I just for, yeah. for a second, the, the point on OKRs, I just think is, is really, really important um, when you think about, and again, I'll just maybe summarize it from the standpoint of OKRs being more results driven um, or, or the impact that we're making versus um, KPIs, which I feel like OKRs is going to replace or key performance indicators, right? The indicators I felt like for a long time now um, were just that indicators, right? And I, I would always tell my leadership team, key performance indicators are an invitation to a conversation to understand how things are going, right? Like, you know, you might have an employee who is struggling this week, according to their key performance indicators. Well, it's an invitation for a conversation of saying, hey, how was your week, right? I might have an investigator who was dealing with a tough case or a big case. Well, guess what? I kind of want you to spend the time on that tough big case versus being focused in on how many cases I complete things of that nature. And I, and I think it's just really important for people that result side keeps us focused in on what are we here for and why are we doing it versus the KPIs can start to be the way that, um, you know, people kind of get dulled a little bit and saying, well, I, I did all the numbers, right? But did I do what was really important? Did I do the best possible thing? So I, I love the point, Victor, I know OKRs for sure. I, I think you've um, hit the nail on the head um, regarding uh, the vision of the organization and the organizational goals, but um, I think it's important to also individualize or personalize uh, goals that are tied to those broader, uh, either your team, your group, or the overall organization, uh, because those are the things that they can accomplish uh, on a regular basis and feel really good about and feel they've accomplished something significant on behalf of the organization. Yeah, you absolutely need both, you need both for sure. Yeah. Uh, let's take a few moments now to hear from our sponsor, Arizona Commerce Authority, and then we'll come back. And the first question we'd like to kind of tee up is what's happening with AI and how's that changing leadership? What are you witnessing? But for right now, we'd like to hear a word from Arizona Commerce Authority. Our streamlined pro-business approach helps you achieve more by putting less between you and future success. 
less red tape, lower taxes, less distance separating you from the tech leaders of tomorrow. This innovative ecosystem will supply your business with tools and resources to compete in the 21st century and beyond. But your future is more than just business success. In Arizona, the lifestyle you want is at your fingertips. Explore cities known for their Southwest heritage and modern vision. Enjoy beautiful scenery and endless outdoor activities on land, water, or snow. And if you're looking for a little friendly competition, we've got plenty of teams to choose from. With constant sunshine, vibrant culture, and natural wonder, Arizona provides a style of living that's entirely unique. People from all over the world call our state home. From student leaders who fill the classrooms of our top-ranked universities, to a skilled and abundant workforce that's ready for what's next. To the neighbors, friends, and peers we interact with daily, Arizonans are united by a pioneering spirit that moves us forward. So as you look to the future, know that it's filled with the perfect balance of innovation and high quality living that makes life better here. And we're back. <laughs> so here's kind of what I was uh, listening for. And as a quick recap for the first portion of our program, uh, obviously listening is really critical, staying agile, uh, not only just staying in your lane, but being willing to say, hey, I've got this great idea and being willing to listen. Right people and right seats. I don't think anybody spoke to that. However, that really is, I think, the baseline about what you're all talking about. When we're hiring, are we hiring folks with the right skill set mind and the ability to grow into uh, whatever capacity we need them for? And, and are they being put in the correct seats, right? And listening to what their concerns are. And then, of course, reach goals. Uh, so all of those moving parts uh, make up for great leadership and great organizational culture. Now enter in AI and how, it, how is that changing leadership and what are you seeing uh, developing already in that space? Yeah, happy to maybe hop in. Um, I think it's still early in a lot of these uh, uh, areas. Um, look, I had a conversation re recently or, or late last year um, and talking a little bit about AI and it, it dawned on me a little bit of like the similarities to the Terminator movies, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's Cybernet or whatever it is um, that kind of made some decision. I, I think because again, leadership is a lot about making decisions and being able to help in those areas. I think right now where we are, where AI is being helpful um, and kind of where it's heading is, it's helping leaders, I think, to digest and understand the merit of information, right? Like the, the markets and industries we're in aren't the only things being saturated with data right now. And leaders are also being saturated with data and metrics and lots of different things that are indicators of one thing or the other. <clears throat> Done, I think, you know, I'll, I'll use the word done correctly, at least initially, I, I think AI can help leaders to understand and digest some of that data, be able to operate a little bit quicker, be able to engage faster, um, you know, see when an employee maybe needs help a little sooner uh, versus allowing for things to kind of, you know, go on maybe too long. Uh, we've, we've talked about uh, before how leaders act fast when there's a personnel need not an issue, but a need, someone needs something. I think AI has been capable of doing that. We're doing some things now um, at PayPal from a leadership perspective that is is hopefully able there to help connect our leaders to just understanding and digesting the data a little bit more. Outside of that, I, I think it's still really open of how it's gonna help and change leadership. I do not foresee a person having a conversation with um, some AI back in that says, you know, hello, how are you doing? And like, here's all the things that's kind of going on. I, I hope not, <laughs> right? That's where we're going. But I, I do think there's an extension or augmentation to the leader's work that they do in preparation for making a decision that AI is helpful with. Yeah, that's <clears throat> that's a great summary. It'll it'll help with data, help interpret data. There's another area for AI in business and involving leadership, and in that AI can really streamline a lot of administration. But to do it well in involves, uh, requires really involving the people that are going to be impacted by it. And whether they stay with the organization or not, or you find another role for them. And if they stay with the organization, their role is going to change. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's a key thing you have to talk with them about and under fully understand or your eight, or it'll be rejected. Mm 
by the, the, the employees who still have some power to reject things like that. Uh, in recruiting, I do a lot with recruiting, and I remind people AI can do terrific things. We can find people that we want to hire pretty quickly, but watch out for some of the bias that is there. Um, and particularly if, uh, if the computer is conducting an interview and looking at facial expressions while you speak, that's not perfected against bias. And so I think we still have to be careful. But uh, it's going to help. It's going to, uh, you know, we have, you know, in the science area, what it can do in, in, in unknown correlations for causes of cancer or heart disease is incredible. And that's unfolding. I find that very exciting, kind of another topic. But um, I'm excited about it. I agree that it's um, it's early days. Um, I, um, I my first reaction is that you know it is a form of helping us organize all the data that's out there for data driven decisions, um, which I think is is the obvious one. Um, I know our marketing and communications team see this as an opportunity. Um, how do we use AI to become you know a sector leader? Um, because it is it is taking all the the inputs. Um, and, and manipulating them. So how do we how do we elevate what we do in our sector using AI? But you know, just recently I had a conversation with a colleague, and they were doing an industry white paper, and to their shock, the person that they were co-authoring uh, uh, this paper with actually plagiarized using AI. So I mean, I would not want to be a high school teacher or a university professor right now <laughs> with AI. But uh, so so I think there's some caution out there as well. Um, you know with that that's content related, absolutely. But early days, early days. We'll figure it out. You're yeah. so right, Carol. You know, people at Sa uh, Samsung were uh, out solving uh, software programming issues on AI until they realized their proprietary softwares were now in uh, out there on the internet. And um, so you got to really be careful with that. Uh, plagiarism is a big deal. Sports Illustrated, some other organizations have really had some problems there and have been sued. New York Times has started kind of, we're going to sue you whenever we see you philosophy, plagiarizing yeah. articles. So it's, yeah, early days, a lot to work through. Yeah, I think it's going to be pretty interesting. Just, you know, as a, uh, I have twin girls that are 10 years old and, um, I, I don't know, I think maybe three years ago, they were getting help with their math work from Alexa, right? Of, hey, give me this, whatever it may be. It even forced me then to think about, like, what do I really want to, the, how do I want them to be able to utilize it? Because it's going to be a part of their lives. Yeah. What do I really want them to be capable of doing? Do I want them to be capable of knowing and using it as a tool? Do I want them to be stunted in their own level of creativity because now something else is doing it for them? So, like, it's just really interesting. Even then, I tried to help them to understand when they want to use it and when they don't. But yeah, I caught them like three years ago, just rattling off math problems to Alexa, right? And getting answers. But So uh, just a little anecdote. My my son is in the Space Force and um, he tells me that they, they've been using generative AI for a lot longer than the public has been. And that he and his colleagues use it every day. They, they see it like pretty much everything else that we use in the workplace as a tool. But it's like having, the, my son says, it's like having the, the smartest, most uh, capable person in the world sitting next to you as your colleague, and you can ask them anything about anything at any, any point. So it really is about um, you know, improving, getting rid of redundant uh, tasks, like you were saying, and um, you know, being able to draw upon incredible resources uh, that we never had access to before. This is an order of magnitude better than just Googling it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, but I think it gets back to what we were talking about earlier with leaders and listening. Well, first it starts probably with asking the right question, right. you know, at times, right? And there's 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 entire programs designed now around prompts. Mm -hmm. And again, I've got 10 year olds that are going through some of these programs just around, how do you ask the right question? Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think we're gonna start to put a premium on the people that can ask the right question understand the right opportunity from that. And this might be part of the curve, right? It's less of who can solve the complicated problem, but it's a little bit more of like, what is the problem? What is the right question? It seems to be where things are maybe tilting toward a little bit. The, the importance to this conversation today is that every leader is going to have to deal with how do we use uh, AI in our environment and how do we use it effectively? And 
not get into the situations where we're exposing our intellectual property to people outside <laughs> the enterprise. So um, I want to move on to another question. Um, if you went into my office, you would see a, a bookshelf. It probably has 200 books in it. And I would say 65% of them are on management and leadership, right? Um, <laughs> we've all read a lot of them. Uh, what are the the books that you all are listening to, listening, I say listening to, because a lot of us listen to books now, or reading, that you really think um, people can draw on to learn about how to be extraordinary leaders? I'm going to, I'm going to jump in actually, um, because it, it, somebody, I, I don't even know who said that, but um, having right people in the right, right seats. I just reread um, recently the rower's code. Yep. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with that one, but that's really what it's about. How do you, how do you have the right people in the right seats? Um, this is from 2011. Um, it, it's Marilyn Crick, Crick Co. Um, is the author, but but it's really you know how do you manage your way through that? Because um, you're because the book starts out with people in the wrong seats and the you know it, it, it's not rowing the right way. Um, and how do you move through that? How do you also build enough trust within the team that you can have difficult conversations? How do you how do you have a safe platform to raise issues? Um, so, so to me, I, I just, I, I don't know if that was you, Art, or Victor that said, right people in the right seats. And that's what that book is all about. That was actually Karen. That was the, the ghost voice with no face. <laughs> oh, the ghost voice. There you go. And, Brilliant. Um, there, I was like, are you reading my mind? <laughs> there's a, another book in, in my bookshelf called Traction. I don't yes. know if any of you have read it. One of my it, favorites. But, yeah. Uh, and it, it uh, describes a system called EOS, but it focuses yeah. heavily on that concept, mm -hmm. uh, Carol, about having the right people in the right seats. Art? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll go off of uh, a book that I recently picked up again uh, for the first time uh, in a while and one that I recently finished. So um, a book that I recently finished was uh, Multipliers by Liz Grossman. And I promise I, I do listen to more people than those that are just from the Bay Area. Um, <laughs> but the book Multiplier, I'll, I'll summarize really quickly, but basically it's around trying to, from a leadership standpoint, right? That's, again, that's our goal is to, how can we ensure that we are an additive to anyone that we come in contact with for people to be at their best, right? Like I, I when I think about you know, what I'd like to, to hear folks that have an opportunity to work with me is that, wow, I did some of my best work around art, whether that's as a leadership standpoint or a colleague or whatever it may be, um, I feel like I did some of my best work. And, and the book is really around trying to find out how can you be a multiplier of that type of style of, of work, that energy, um, that ability for someone to feel like they've been amplified by the person that they're around. But then it also talks about on the other side of that, um, what, the, what they called accidental diminishers. And, you know, these are our leaders that, um, and unfortunately, as I read this book, I found some uh, accidental diminishing tendencies in myself where um, as a leader, for example, I used to think about, hey, my, my biggest goal is to remove roadblocks and to make things easier for my team to, to work and do what they need to do. Uh, when at times I might've been removing a great experience for them. I might've been, um, you know, not empowering them. I might've been, you know, making them mm. feel as though, hey, they're not capable or some of these different things. So <clears throat> it's a very interesting uh, book on how do you do that? And also how do you take people and continue the cycle of making them like your A plus person, right? You're really your top um, individual. And a lot of that comes with stretch and a lot of that comes with new opportunities. And so that's one. And the other I'll just say that I recently picked up was uh, it, it's called Martin Luther King on leadership. Uh, but there's a book. Uh, well, in the book, it, it talks a lot about you know, how do you go, how do you make sure that you're also doing the work of communicating and letting people know what you're working on and what you're doing and that there's a benefit to doing that. And again, <clears throat> Martin Luther King threw a lot of his civil rights work. Um, it was important for him to have an audience, right? There was like, you know, all the strategies he had around media. And, and you know, if you think about it now, like he was way ahead of his time when you think about social media and what we do now, but there is some really important th aspects around if you're at a large company or any of those things, like how you're able to do that and how you're able to really like stretch and ensure that people are understanding the work that you're doing. So I, I just thought those two were really interesting when sometimes you can go about doing your work kind of silently and fill and you hope everyone knows and you hope everyone knows like kind of what you're working on. So mm -hmm. I thought those I, were two. I, I try and do that um, every week. I have a weekly staff meeting with the whole team. And I think it's important for me to articulate to them all the things that I'm doing. 
uh, that support all the things that they're doing. And um, so I, that's a critical opportunity to be able to do that when you're meeting, you know, face to face with the team. Mm -hmm. These are these are great books that you've you mentioned. Um, trying to add to them, uh, one thing I would say is situational leadership. It's not new at all, but for people who are learning to become managers, and it's in the book, the One Minute Manager and the Digital One Minute Manager, understanding situational situational leadership and that different people yeah. that report to you need to be um, managed and developed differently, differently. from mm -hmm. the from the one who's the expert and self-motivated to maybe someone who's capable but not motivated, how to do that. Smooth, uh, moving up to the executive level, and VPs have a very different role than managers. Ram Sharan's book, this is going back a while, I believe it's called The Leadership Challenge. He wrote two of them. The other one was, well, he wrote more than two, um, The Five Things the CEO Wants You to Know. But that book, particularly for executives, lays out you know, what it's critical for you to do it's still very viable. You have to up the technology, a technology vision, which you talked about earlier, Steve. You know, the technology vision, if you lead IT at P PayPal or investigations and compliance, how is IT going to help? That needs to be added to what he talks about. But, you know, very critical on uh, what you need to do in, in these. I think One Minute Manager was one of the earliest <laughs> uh, leadership books that I read, and I still use it every day, right? pretty fundamental. Uh, I don't want to hog the mic here. No, uh, you're, do Karen. you're doing great. Uh, I want to make sure that we have a chance. We've only got about 10 minutes left. And then we have some really great con uh, questions that we had anticipated asking you. Uh, and uh, Victor, you just kind of alluded to this uh, between management and vice president roles. What advice would you have for newly promoted management? And then a follow up question to that is, is there a difference? What is the difference and advice you would give for newly promoted vice presidents? So one of the most read blogs I've written is called "You Congratulations on Being Promoted to VP. Now, now you have to learn a new job. So you throw away what got you there because now you have to step into this strategic level. Mm -hmm. And uh, kind of picking up at something, uh, Steve, you hinted at, you know, I've unfortunately run into VPs in industry who never learned to delegate. They were a micromanager. They only feel comfortable when they're a taskmaster and on top of it all. You can't do it as a VP and they will not succeed and they will not succeed. So when you're in moving into management, you're no longer the technical expert or the person that got the most done. Now you have to lead others. And that's a very different challenge. And the same thing at VP. It's a very different challenge that you have to step into. And people really many people really need help in understanding that challenge and developing their roles. I mean, that's where uh, coaching comes in and it's incredibly important. You know, I, I, I learned that lesson fairly early in my career, fortunately, but um, I'm an engineer, so I tend to be very detail oriented. Mm -hmm. And so early in my career, I was very much a micromanager. Um, and how empowering is it when you essentially put the responsibility onto the team member and they're able to outperform anything that you would you would ever get if you continue to tell them what to do and direct them what to do uh, every day. So that's, that's such an important lesson. Well, it goes back to building that trust and that psychological safety. I couldn't possibly offer up my value and my worth and, and give you some ideas if I'm afraid that you're going to shoot me down or, you know, redirect me to the task that you thought that I was supposed to be working on. Granted, to your point earlier, our, we need to make sure that we're goal for focused and we know the mission and vision, but that psychological safety cannot be overstated because that's the baseline for everything. Now, you have to be careful because going back to situational uh, leadership, not everyone, you know, some people need a lot of direction. So you have to ferret out Find the know, balance. who needs uh, the direction and who you just want to give the goal and let them go. Yep. 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 We don't have time for this question today. And I want to make sure I hear from both of you, but uh, just a couple of episodes ago on, on one of my shows that I host on my own, we talked to a couple people around these, these uh, culture indexes and these personality assessments and that sort of thing. There's so much value in hiring people and giving them these kind of assessments from the very beginning to make sure they are the right people in the right seat. But that's a whole nother episode. That's a great point, though. <laughs> yeah, that's such a great point. 
So uh, either of you, uh, Art or Carol, would you like to add on to our conversation and what uh, Victor had just shared about, you know, the, really the difference and, and how we might encourage someone who's just been promoted either to a management position or to vice presidency? I'll, I'll make just really quick underscore what Steve said around and, and look, you know, I probably have some folks from my team listening, so they'll be like, Art, uh, be true. Um, <laughs> Uh, is I oftentimes talk about having a, a leader as practitioner model, and I stress this constantly as you know, a leader, you have to know and understand your business. Now, there's to what extent and what degree. Um, I personally like to, like if I have a person who's doing an investigation, I wanna do the investigation too, right? I wanna be capable in understanding it, even if I'm not gonna be at their level, but even if, if it's to understand the pain points in a much more intimate way, I think that's still important to do. So you know, as, as you continue to kind of move up, if you're in the same company, same industry, I think that's, that presents one set of, you know, challenges or issues. I think if you're moving over from, let's say one company to another, same industry type, or, you know, even, you know, crossing over different industries still, I, I think it's important to make sure we, we keep that piece of it. But Steve, to your point, I, I mean, you've got to empower people that, and trust that they know more, right? And they're, they're more capable in this area. And your role or responsibility is now just shifted or is different. You've got to understand that. Um, I will go be going back, Victor, and checking out that blog for sure. <laughs> I, I wrote it down as well, just so you know, Victor. I think, I think you covered it. I think it's, you know, congratulations, you have a brand new job. Because everything you've worked for, everything that's gotten you there, is not the skill set or the the talent uh, that you need to to excel in that VP role. So really be open to mentorship, um, to guidance from the CEO. The CEO is not going to throw you in the deep end without you know without his his or her support. So um, I, I completely agree. It's a brand new job. So I, I mentioned early on, um, you know, that leadership and management are two different things. And, um, you know, management is important, right? We've got to be able to manage the business. We've got to be able to manage the team. But leadership is something different. Can each of you sort of speak to, to help us clarify those differences? Leadership just feels bigger to me. Um, it just management feels a little bit more transactional, feels a little bit more like, how can I assist you and help you in this area? Leadership starts to feel like it, um, you know, I had a leader before that said the best leaders think further. Um, they're able to, you know, consider more different aspects or, or other aspects of it. And I think when you're really putting that leadership hat on, you're probably taking a, a pause or a step back. It even, it even looks like it's in a different environment sometimes, right? Sometimes leadership is pins down in your thoughts about what you need to do to either help someone or do, do that sort of thing. But also leadership is just about supporting someone else in a different style, a different way. Um, I think I, I think it's less of the transaction aspect that you know you might start to feel sometimes. I agree. And, and building upon what, what you said, um, leadership's about inspiring, creating that vision, inspiring, speaking to the need of that, uh, how the work that we do as a company and each team contributes to the greater human, higher good that's out there. And many of our companies, particularly in technology, have that higher good that they can speak to. Even garbage collection companies can speak to that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that, you know, that inspiring aspect, the big visioning, now you need management, you got to get the job done, you got to develop people, all of that good stuff. But I mean, that's how I would do it. I was going to say John Cotter uh, at Harvard writing in the Harvard Business Reviews goes back to about 2013, had just a great article on, on these two, these two dynamics. Carol, anything to add? Yeah, I really look at this as vision and mission. Um, I look at it as a visionary and missionaries. Um, so I, I, I completely agree with with uh, uh, the the other comments that you know, as a leader, you know, we need to influence, motivate, and enable um, others to contribute to the organization's success. And so we need to be we need to be the enablers. We need to be the ones at the front of the ship. Um, and really inspiring the others to, to to come along and row with us, right? I mean, from the from the rowers' code. So, so that's to me is where I, I differentiate the visionary and missionary um, portions of that. So, Karen, before we go to final bits of wisdom from our uh, panelists today, I, I'd like to mention that the Arizona Technology Council for 16 years now has run what we call peer to peer networks, um, and we run CEO networks. Uh, we've had one in Tucson that's been operating for, I guess, the entire 16 years. People come and go, but somewhere between 12 and 15, uh, maybe even up to 17 CEOs in that one. And um, we, we did them here in 
Phoenix for years and years, and then they sort of fell off, but we brought it back last year and we just built our second uh, class. Um, so if any of our audience are interested in it, we call it the CEO network, but it's for anyone who's the leader of their organization. It could be a, an owner, a general manager, you know, who whoever leads the organization. Um, and it, it, if you've heard of Vistage, these groups are sort of Vistage-like and um, people develop an extraordinary camaraderie um, through working together. It's in a safe space. Everyone uh, signs a non-disclosure um, uh, and, and it's just fantastic. Fantastic. People uh, have loved participating in these. And the fact that there are a few people in that first network that have been there for 16 years. Uh, I mean, CEOs don't have a lot of time and this is a half a day once a month. Wow. So um, it's highly valuable. If anyone uh, in our audience is interested, please uh, reach out to me. And with that, what we'd like to do is uh, ask for a, a final bit of wisdom from each of our uh, uh, panelists on what everyone should know about leadership. Carol, why don't we go to you first? Oh, no. Um, my director of marketing communications dared me to share my, my mantra because everybody should have a mantra. And I said, I don't know if this is the right crowd for this or not, but absolutely. Um, here it goes. Here it goes. It's lick from the lollipop of mediocrity and you will suck forever. So <laughs> digest that, digest that. We just need to end there. <laughs> no, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, leadership is lonely. Um, I think, I think what's really important is, um, you know, my, my father had a saying and he goes, you know, never take money advice from somebody that wasn't rich. So I think it's really important that we all have mentors. We all have peers that we need to surround ourselves with that are the leaders that we want to be, that have the same, you know, um, ethical compasses, that they do business the same way that we want to do that. None of us know everything. None of us are perfect. We all have room to grow. So, you know, surround yourself with the people that, that you want to be, not just because of they're, they're a really important person in your community. Um, so I think, I think those are the, that's how I'm going to close this out is, is, you know, surround yourself with, with the leaders that, you know, the leaders and CEOs that you want to be ultimately, and, uh, make sure that you see yourselves in, in, in them as well. And I'm assuming your father meant rich in wisdom as well. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> I've translated it a few times. <laughs> Art? I, I like the the lollipop one, um, and we look. We do a lot of swag at PayPal, so Carol, you might get a shirt at some point. <laughs> I love that. On it. Uh, it. <laughs> we'll wear it together whenever we're around. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, I, I I think I would just I'll, I'll leave it on on two things. One, leadership is not a role. You're not appointed to leadership. It's not a title. You can lead in absolutely everything you do. Um, it, you know, I have countless amounts of conversations with people saying, "Hey, I'm ready to be promoted, or I want to be a leader, or I want to do those things," and I'm like, "Go do it." Go, mm -hmm. go lead, right? Rather you're, and again, I even have a conversation with my daughters, right? Like they want to do certain things, go do it, right? Like you don't need to wait for something for it. Um, I, I think is, is kind of the big one. And, and I'll just hit on one thing too around diversity of teams. Um, and when I say diversity, this isn't about the boxes you can check and those sort of things. Um, I just think it's really important as we're building teams, as you're looking at your team on a constant basis that you look around and you say, well, wow, we all might look different. We all might check different boxes, but Hmm. Did we all go to the same school? Did we all come from the same company? Do we all have the same ideals? That's not diversity. So mm -hmm. constantly push yourselves to bring in a level of diversity. That's a diversity of thought and perspectives that will prepare you and your team for the challenges you're not even sure you're going to face. Right. No one knew we would deal with the summer of 2020 or the early part of 2020 with COVID, social mm -hmm. issues, all these different things. But the teams that I think that were most embraced or most intact from a diversity standpoint were able to really kind of weather some of those things and stay focused and and do the right things from that standpoint. So, And all, all the research shows that more diverse teams are more effective teams. Mm -hmm. Very true. Very true. I mean, I, I would say the lollipop, hard to top that. Uh, <laughs> what you've mentioned and just build upon it, strive to that vision. If you're an executive, enthusiastically report it move forward, make decisions, move forward, gather data, have people around you that are supportive, as you've mentioned, Carol. And I also want to take an opportunity to point out what a wonderful organization you run, Steve. Absolutely. 
with all of the support for the technical businesses here in the community, the 401k, the advocacy, the what you do for seed money coming to these mm -hmm. organizations, the camaraderie that there it's I've been in organizations in San Francisco and in LA. And this is top. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Oh. Uh, and I appreciate Carol, your closing notes really just reiterated and stressed the importance of what Steve had mentioned about the CEO network. So for our viewers and listeners, please take time to connect with Steve and get on the website to learn more about uh, that opportunity, because really we can all support each other. And, and when we really deeply care about each other, right, we can right. find new opportunities and create new, uh, new wins for everybody. We want to thank our panelists for being here today. You guys have each brought incredible wisdom. And we also want to thank our uh, sponsor, Arizona Commerce Authority, for bringing us this conversation today. If you're interested in being a podcast participant or a sponsor for the AZ Tech Council's AZ TechCast, then please contact marketing at aztechcouncil.org to learn more about opportunities to further position you as a tech expert, influencer, and innovator. Again, I'm Karen Nowicki, hidden somewhere in the corner. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to having you with us next time on AZ TechCast. Thank you for joining us for this episode of AZ TechCast with Arizona Technology Council, featuring leading tech and business experts that help influence and shape our great state and the industries they serve.